Hello and welcome to Rando Rob. Each week on Rando Rob, I'll be showing and discussing one item from my large collection of collections. New shows appear every Monday and throughout the week, I'll be adding older episodes of Rando Rob that were previously only available to my Patreon subscribers. You can watch episodes of Rando Rob on YouTube at youtube.com forward slash Rob O'Hara. Just look for the Rando Rob playlist. Audio versions of the show are available on my website at podcast.robohara.com or through iTunes. Just search for Rando Rob. Thanks for watching or listening, and I hope you enjoy this vintage episode of Rando Rob. Hey, uh, good morning, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Rando Rob, uh, where I talk about uh, random things that are located in my uh, computer room here. And, um, uh, I was just out in the garage and my workshop, both of those, and uh, I was just reminded of how much crap, I mean treasure, uh, that I have sitting out there um, that hasn't been unpacked since we moved, uh, which by the way is where this is the, uh, I've been moved for two years, so it's really time to get the garage unpacked and all that stuff out, um, but uh so who knows, there might be uh, more episodes of Rando Rob where I go mobile and go out in the garage or the workshop or uh, the movie room or who knows. Uh, but one thing is for sure, I will never run out of things to show. Uh, I think this this is episode 30-ish, somewhere in there. Um, <clears throat> and I own somewhere around 100,000 items. So uh, I should probably record a bunch of these and then just have them scheduled after I die <laughs> for each week. <laughs> I have to predict when that day will be, and so I will use some sort of uh, filter and make myself look like a ghost, and I'll be like, well, today we'll look at this Star Wars figure. <laughs> uh, anyway, <clears throat> um, so I'm sure uh, that you've noticed over time, I have started uh, putting things on these shelves behind me, and I actually need a lot more shelves. Um, I might... Uh, do this corner in shelves too and kind of butt them up in like an L shape. I haven't really decided yet. Uh, but there, uh, if you look this way behind me, notice there's a couple of items missing and that's because I've brought them over here today to show off for Rando Rob. And um, I want to show you this. But I have to show you something else first before I show you this. Before I show you that, I have to show you this. <laughs> so I am not an expert on either of these computers, uh, but this is a, a Commodore Plus 4. Uh, you can see the logo there. You can see that it has a uh, similar style keyboard to the uh, Commodore 64. You've got these little um, directional Instead of uh, the old cursor, and um, uh, there's a lot of differences <laughs> between this and a Commodore 64. On this side, uh, we have a, uh, I believe, in there a, uh, yeah, the power button and a power adapter. Notice that neither one of those look like the ones on the uh, Commodore 64. On this side, you have a couple of uh, outputs. You've got video there and stuff, and then of course. Uh, you have some ports. Some of those look familiar. Some of those do not look familiar. <clears throat> so, in uh, 1984, and I apologize if I get any of this wrong because, uh, I, I, like I said, these are not uh, um, my uh, bailiwick, <laughs> I guess is the right word. Um, <clears throat> Commodore, as you know, uh, led by Jack Trammell. Jack Trammell was... Um, a pretty uh, aggressive businessman, and he was uh, always not not just trying to make his product the best, but also bury his competitors. And uh, so, one of his uh, things, one of his goals, was to look at what the competition was doing and just figure out, you know, ways basically to to run them out of business. And um, there there was a bit of a gap between uh, the Commodore 64 and, and the Commodore VIC-20. And there were several computers that were starting to fill that gap. Uh, and, and specifically one I know is the uh, Texas Instruments, the TI-99, right? But uh, there were a, a few other computers in that, in that uh, 
market space that were uh, cheaper than the Commodore 64, and but did less than the Commodore 64, but more than the VIG-20. And so I feel like Commodore 64, Commodore Business Machine, CBM, uh, the company, I feel like they uh, could have done worse than just supported the Commodore 64 and possibly the Commodore 28 until we got to the 16-bit uh, machines, until we got to the Amiga, you know. Um, but uh, that was not Jack Tramiel's way. Uh, Jack Tramiel was always, you know, they, they kept saying, well, we made this computer and it was popular. And so another a great business model would be to just keep making new computers and keep making new models. And it's, a, you know, looking back in history, it's such a strange decision to... Um, I mean, it, it's, it's, um, it's like, it, it's hard to compare it with cars because cars are so expensive, but imagine if you had the, you somehow built like the perfect car, the car was better than everybody else's car. And it was at a price point that just made it, uh, uh, just a no brainer. I mean, like if you made a, a Corvette or something and, uh, and it was just at a price where everybody could afford it, and it was a great car, and everybody loved it. And somebody else was making, you know, this little two-seater hatchback thing that barely ran, you know. And then you were like, well, we got to make something else to, to push those guys out of business. Well, you already got the Corvette. I mean, you already have the <laughs> the best thing, you know. So I, I don't know. That's a, maybe a strange analogy. But, uh, but it's just that idea of, like, going after the, um, you know, people below you and trying to drive them out of business. So anyway, um, uh, what Commodore came out with, uh, they said they were going to release a new line of computers. Now, this was literally uh, not that long after the release of the Commodore 64. Um, this is in 1984, you know, so the Commodore 64 is still kind of new and shiny and, and still um, finding its place in the, in the marketplace, you know, and, and um uh, you know, the C64 is being compared to other 8-bit computers at the time. I mean, if you, uh, I enjoy the Apple II. You know, I like the Apple II. But if you put an Apple II next to a Commodore 64, there's there's no denying which one looks better, which one sounds better. You know, um, so I mean, I I feel like, um, uh, you know, like they had their marketplace, and but. Um, but they just wanted to come out with new machines. And so this is what they came out with was this plus four. Now this was the, there were three machines uh, that were released in this line of computers. And I own two of them. And the third one is uh, basically was European only. I've never seen one in the U S um, and uh, if I, I might pick one up someday just to put it on the shelf next to the other two. But uh but so this was Commodore's answer, and this was designed to be their big business machine. Now, why was it their business machine? Well, it's because um, along with the uh, four, that this isn't really what the what the plus four refers to. What the plus four refers to is that it came with um, four programs built in that, if you think about it, are kind of like Microsoft Office or some sort of. Um, uh, a package deal. So there was a word press, uh, word processor. There was a spreadsheet, you know, database. I think there was a graphics uh, thing. So, um, so those were built into this machine. Uh, and so, I mean, on the surface, I mean, if you think about it, you go, okay, well, that's not a bad idea. I mean, all those programs are available on the Commodore 64. So you can just buy those programs and, and use it on the 64. Uh, this has 64 K of Ram just like the Commodore 64. Now the processor inside this is different. The the internal processor and um, the design is different than the Commodore 64. Um, the processor in this is called the TED. Um, so there's no SID, <laughs> there's no VIC, there is only TED. Uh, the um, graphics and sound capabilities are built into TED. So there aren't separate chips for everything like there is in the Commodore 64. It's just this one processor. Now, the good news is the TED processor, uh, first of all, it's faster than the Commodore 64. It runs at 2 gigahertz instead of 1 gigahertz. So that's good news. Um, it also can do uh, 121 different colors. Now, I had to look this up. 
it does 15, well, just like the Commodore 64 does 16 colors, right? Okay, but one of those is black. So technically, let's just say 15 colors plus black. Well, this can do those same 15 colors, but each one has its own uh, luminosity setting. So you can set brightness for each color, for, uh, and there's eight different levels. So technically, you have eight times or eight times 15, which gets you 120 different colors, and then you add black back in. Black is always black, right? Uh, so th that gives you 121 colors. So uh, that is good news. I mean, many more colors than the Commodore 64, which can only do 16 colors. Uh, bad news, number one, no hardware sprites. So one of the things that makes the Commodore 64 so memorable and so great to program for and all those classic games is that it can do hardware sprites. This can't do hardware sprites. Any sprites have to be done uh, through software. Number two, the sound chip on this is not like the SID chip. It's not very good, to be honest with you. Um, so you have a few things on here that seem superior to the Commodore 64. Where is the problem? Well, number one, not compatible with the Commodore 64. You have a computer that today, uh, with uh, when we look back, has one of the largest software libraries of any system ever released. So why would you come out with something within a couple of years that's not compatible with that? It's it's mind boggling why they why they did that. Uh, you know, I, they learned their lesson right with the Commodore 128, which has a Commodore 64 mode, which makes it 99.99% compatible with the Commodore 64 titles. Um, and so, you know, that, that makes sense. Right. And, and I think maybe they learned that lesson from, uh, the plus four. Now I didn't have any interest to be honest with you, uh, in the plus four at the time when it came out, I was uh, somewhat aware of it. Uh, I can tell you that some of the ports on the back, like there are things that are missing. The uh, tape drive is a different connection. So you could just, um, you know, take some of your old, some peripherals were compatible, some were not. But uh, at that same time, they released this, which I think, I'm going to hold this up for a second. I think this is the best looking co uh, computer Commodore ever released. I, this is absolutely, number one, my favorite looking computer. I love the black case. I love the gray keys. Uh, the whole thing just looks stunning. I, I absolutely love uh the commodore the looks <laughs> of the commodore 16 again i mean it is basically a commodore 64 case but it's not as we will learn here in a minute um so let's take, if you're familiar with the commodore 64 you know on the right hand side you have your two atari joystick your two db9 joystick ports and your power switch well uh, on this, they have changed the joystick port style. They've made them a round uh, nine pin. Now, functionally, they are identical. They just changed it. Uh, they said they wanted to change it to save real estate on this side. By, by uh, changing that, they just made this incompatible with millions of joysticks on planet Earth. Uh, you can see there is a reset switch. There's an on-off switch. And then there's a little power adapter, which is not what we're familiar with, if you know the Commodore 64. Uh, nothing on this side. If we look at the back, uh, we can see right there, there's supposed to be ports there. <laughs> That's where your modem goes. There's supposed to be a user port. There's supposed to be a data set port. Uh, but those things are missing. And we do have the uh, familiar hookups for floppy drives. And then over here, we do have a cartridge port. Um, so this is, this looks like a Commodore 64. I mean, generally speaking, if you looked at this, you'd go, what, is, what computer does this remind you of? And you would probably say a Commodore 64. Um, but inside, it is the plus four. It's the other machine that I just showed you, which is why I showed it to you first. It has the same TED uh, processor, which means it's incompatible with the Commodore 64. Bad choice. Um, so what's the difference between this and the plus four? This was the computer that was designed to bury the TI-99 4A and those other computers that were inching up and taking up that real estate, uh, you know, the market between the VIC-20 and the Commodore 64. This was essentially, you could think of this as being the replacement for, 
uh, the VIG-20. It is just like the plus four that I showed you before with two major differences, three major differences, one being uh, different ports missing on the back of the machine. Uh, second of all, instead of 64K of RAM, like the plus four, this only has 16K of RAM. Now, it is hard to believe that anybody in computing, in the computer field at all, would say, you know you know what would be better with our next model? One-fourth the amount of memory. <laughs> what a terrible idea. Why would they do that? Um, and um, so, so that's one of the problems. And the other uh, problem or, you know, difference between this and the other one is that this does not have those four built-in programs, the four productivity uh, programs for that suite. So there's no built-in software. So what does that get you? That gets you a computer with 16K of RAM, uh, which is less than the VIC-20, right, technically, um, and uh, a worse sound chip than the Commodore 64, and no sprites incompatible with the Commodore 64. I mean, what a lame duck of a computer i'm sorry but um now there are if, if you go on youtube i know there's some videos that'll say like oh here's 10 great games for the commodore 16 but if you watch them the 10 best games on the commodore 64 or on the 16 are not as good as the worst 10 games on the commodore 64 that might not be exactly true but uh but you get my meaning that the the software the games for this are just not unfortunately um up to par with the commodore 64 now uh, the pricing on these machines is interesting because this computer, uh, retailed for $99. And again, all the development, all the pricing, all the marketing was intended to go after that market space that the TI-99 4A and a few other computers had, had, had filled in. But by the time this came to market, those machines were already gone. The TI-99 had stopped, uh, or Texas Instruments had stopped production of the uh, TI-99-4A by the time this hit the market. So they didn't need to run those machines off because they were already gone. So they introduced a machine into a marketplace that, that there wasn't a market for. <laughs> it's such a strange thing. Uh, you have to wonder what, what Commodore was thinking. Um, and the fact that Commodore went out of business tells you that sometimes they, they didn't see the uh, forest for the trees, so to speak. So this was a $99 computer. It looked like the Commodore 64. It looks cooler than the Commodore 64. As a kid, I wanted one of these so bad. I saw a picture of one in a magazine, and I wanted it because I all I wanted was the case. I wanted to find one cheap at a garage sale or something, one that was broken, and take the case apart and put my Commodore 64 in this really cool black case. But what, you know... 15 year old me didn't realize because I'd never seen one was that the, uh, it, it wouldn't have worked. Right. Uh, not if I wanted to use my modem, uh, or anything that would, would plug into, uh, the normal ports because, uh, you know, the ports on the back of this just wouldn't have lined up, uh, you know, with the, the motherboard for the Commodore 64. Now the plus four, <laughs> which was the high end of uh, this line of computers Retailed for $299, $299. And the idea was that you would be getting not just this computer, this business. I mean, wouldn't you love to just run your business off this thing? You know, I mean, what what uh, company wouldn't like to have this sitting, you know, right there on their CEO's desk and, and uh, have him, you know, go spreadsheet. Psh, 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 look at me scrolling through my spreadsheet. Um, so $299. <clears throat> By uh, the Christmas of 1984, you could get a Commodore 64 for 199. So a Commodore 64 was a hundred dollars cheaper than that thing. So I guess they thought that the value was that built-in uh, software suite and uh, the faster processor. Which you know, I technically I guess if you're doing databases or something like that, that faster processor might have come in handy. But at what cost? the cost would be a complete incompatibility with all Commodore 64 software. And so if you were trying to run a business and you were already had a program or something that you were doing things, you know, and people did run 
uh, businesses off of Commodore 64. That's not the way that, that we typically think of that computer historically, but uh, there were, you know, companies that kept track of records and things like that. And, and so if you were doing that, uh, it would be tough to buy this and change the way that your your business ran. So, um, I love owning both of these computers. Now, I got both of these computers in a giant purchase lot that I did uh, many years ago. There was a a, a gentleman who was uh, uh, older and was cleaning out his house. He was getting ready for retirement, and he had a gigantic collection of Commodore sixty four hardware and software, which I purchased all in one lot. Uh, and both of those computers came from that lot. In fact, the Commodore 16 has a uh, label. He had tried to sell this stuff uh, uh, separately first and was unable to sell it. And so he sold it all in one giant lot. Uh, but this label on the bottom says Commodore 16, if you can see this. Uh, and then it says $5. <laughs> And he was unable to sell this for five dollars. So, uh, fortunately for him, I came along with a pickup, and I bought a lot of things. <laughs> I came home with a pickup that was more than two layers. The entire bed was two layers stacked of disk drives and computers and software and printers and and uh, all kinds of stuff that I just I spent literally years going through and uh, messing with that. But unfortunately, um, this did not have, uh, and that lot didn't have a data set that was compatible with the Commodore 16 um, or uh, uh, disk drive. It didn't have any any of the, uh, I don't even know if I got a power supply for it, to be honest with you. So neither of these machines have ever actually been turned on since I've owned them. Uh, I did, just didn't get enough parts to get them going. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I've played around with the Commodore 16 through uh, emulation and through the Mister, And so I, I've dabbled in the library but it's not really my go-to my heart always belongs to the commodore 64 so um anyway i just thought i would uh, pull those off the shelf and talk a little bit about them i i hate owning things that i don't really know about i don't know the history about or the um you know historically where they uh where they fit in and so uh i do try to learn about uh, a lot of the things that i own i don't just like to set them up there and and then people come in and they go, what's that? And you go, oh, it's a computer. I don't know anything about it. So I do try to learn stuff. And, and um, you know, as time goes on, maybe I will try to put one of these systems together just to be able to get it going and, and turn on because I, I hate having stuff just for stuff's sake. You know, I like it to, uh, to, serve, a, uh, to serve a purpose. So anyway, uh, that is this week's episode of Retro Rob. Um, I've got... Uh, both this week, uh, episode of You Don't Know Flack and Sprite Castle will be dropping both this week. So uh, keep an eye out for those. Um, so that's all I got for this week. Thank you guys so much for the support. I appreciate everything. And I look forward to talking to you guys on uh, Patreon or the Discord server or wherever you can find me. Uh, don't forget uh, about my Wednesday night streams where I'll be playing goofy stuff and uh, having a good time there too. So see you guys soon. Thank you for everything.